welcome everybody to uh, this workshop that's part of the 2017 Local Foods College. Uh, my name is Wayne Martin. I'm with Extension Livestock Production for Minnesota Extension. Uh, this is the sixth year of the Local Foods College. Um, this program comes to you from University of Minnesota Extension. Linda Kingery, who is with the Northwest Regional Sustainable Development Partnership, is the lead organizer of this event. Um, others involved in the planning are Anna Peterson in Crookston, who's doing our tech work for us. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Karen Lanthier in St. Paul, Marie Kirsch in Brainerd, Molly Zins in Brainerd, me, Wayne Martin on the St. Paul campus, Ben Anderson in Moorhead, Deb Zach in Crookston, and Jake Overgaard in Winona. So we offer a series of workshops over eight weeks that you can watch live at home, or live with others or recorded afterwards. The Local Foods College was created to support farmers and the local food system, both at the commercial level and for those who want to produce food for themselves. This online format allows us to officially reach a wide geographic region, as you can tell by the response to the maps, where we had you check your locations. Imagine trying to bring everyone together in person from those distances. Dr. Travis Hoffman is the new sheep specialist for the University of Minnesota Extension and also holds a joint appointment with North Dakota State University Extension. Uh, before joining Minnesota and NDSU Extension, he was an instructor in meat sciences in the Department of Animal Sciences at SDSU, South Dakota State, starting in September 2015. Uh, for eight years prior to that, he was the Colorado Beef Quality Assurance Coordinator a joint appointment for Colorado State University and the Colorado Cattlemen's Association, Colorado Livestock Association, and the Colorado Beef Council. Travis has taught several sheep-related courses and authored or co-authored numerous articles on sheep industry topics. His background and knowledge contribute greatly to extension programs in both North Dakota and Minnesota. And tonight he'll conduct a presentation on opportunities for sheep and lamb production with small operations. Um, American consumers continually want to know more about where their food comes from. As entrepreneurs with an emphasis for local foods, we can provide the solution for producing lamb and wool that garners premiums and meets the expectations in a changing marketplace. So the question is, are you ready and prepared to shine? as a sheep producer and capitalize on local lamb and wool products. And with that, I'm going to, if I find the ball here, I'm going to turn it over to Travis. All right. All yours, Travis. Hello, Wayne. Uh, I guess I'm ready to shine as a sheep producer, and uh, thank you for those uh, individuals. Uh, we've we've cracked the the 50 uh, attendee list, so we're uh, we're setting new records each time here for Local Foods College. So I'm excited about that. Appreciate your guys' uh, patience uh, for uh, for waiting for us on that one in particular. Uh, something a little bit outside of our realm, but I'm glad you stuck with it and uh, we're able to to find and, and to join us uh, for this evening's uh, approach and program. We're approximately uh, 15 minutes behind uh, probably where uh, we would ideally been right now. Uh, but what, uh, again, I'm an optimist and, and certainly appreciate looking at life that way. I think it's way more fun. And so during that time in this introduction, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, appreciate you answering those questions. And so that what I thought was a really good format for me just to learn a little bit more about what we can expect and, and what's going on in, in your guys' operations. Now, we had a tremendous amount of diversity there from uh, registered suffix to, uh, to tease waters and cheviots and um, also different dorsets and, and different locations from people that are probably uh, seasoned individuals uh, to some that said that they inherited uh, the operation uh, just this past week. And so, again, I'm uh, truthfully going to, uh, to touch on in a attack a pretty large uh, uh, seminar on sheep on a small farm, a natural fit, 
And I think that uh, I want to focus on several different things uh, throughout our uh, throughout our seminar or webinar tonight. And of course, this will be recorded so that you can pass this on to other enthusiasts that we may have uh, in our programs uh, that might be interested in having sheep being a part of their operations. But in particular, uh, we'll, we'll try to touch on several different things throughout this, just so that you know, and as, as Wayne introduced me, I am a, a joint uh, employee through the North Dakota State University Extension Service and also the University of Minnesota Extension. And so I started that this past July, so a little over six uh, months ago uh, is my uh, duration so far in my current position. And uh, I look forward to, again, being a part of your operations and, and hopefully answering some of those questions on what we can talk about relative to our, uh, our sheep production programs. This one's as basic as it gets, ladies and gentlemen, and, and looking at our lamb industry production flow of where we're at. And I'm gonna to touch on this and more so look at the sheep industry uh, of where those get prior to the processing plants. But from a big picture standpoint, we're gonna go through those farms and ranches and then also through a feed yards and then the processors or the packing houses that we have. And then I think that's an important thing that we also don't particularly touch on or think about very often is that in fact, even after those go to those harvest facilities that we still have uh, locations of where those can go. So they can go obviously to grocery stores where you could purchase that lamb, or then also to restaurateurs and chefs and cooks. And primarily as we think about it, and at least uh, how my brain works, I think it's always important to think and realize that we're producing a product, whether that be lamb or wool, uh, that has the customer in mind. And hopefully I'll try to bring that together a little bit in our discussion about both lamb and wool. And then think of, of how we're looking at it from a small operation. And, and I saw in a previous discussion in our chats that somebody said, well, how can we be able to make profit from wool from a small operation? And that certainly is probably one thing that would we be a little bit more challenging and, and it makes it important that we can be able to diversify. This slide I put on uh, was just recently put out within the last month and in calendar year 2017 that looks at the sheep inventory and the lamb production as of January 1st, 2017. And so we actually saw in calendar year 2015 an increase of 2000, uh, an increase um, just shortly uh, here, let's see, um, at the bottom end um, of sheep production, but we've since dropped just slightly, uh, and we're at all sheep and lambs at 5.2 million head uh, in the United States. Breeding use 3.85, and of course, the approximate balance of that of about 1.35 million head were marketed lambs, or lambs that were in the supply chain to be marketed. And this was as of January 1st, of this past year. So I think that this is a fun slide. And again, as we start and aim to discuss several different things relative to sheep and lamb production is to keep this in mind. And I got to borrow a little bit, but I also think this as well. And as we think about our job, and as I said, I focus on our customer first, of what are our products? And if we look at those and go across the line from left to right, we have uh, some lambs uh, there actually uh, in an, with an Idaho backscape. We have crossbred lambs that are important to us as well. And then it splits from either the top or the bottom where we can have lamb carcasses that we can expect leg slices or rack of lamb or even a, a sirloin cutlet on the top or some wool top and making some wool clothing that certainly we're well aware of. Question, let's see, question comes uh, from uh, our chat of what explains the drop uh, since the early 90s. And we'll talk about that here in, in just a little bit as well. But I wanted to show this to you uh, just so that you have this as a, a demographic and could I somewhat identify where some of those um, particular animals were. I spent my master's and PhD degree here in Colorado in the, in the northern part of Colorado. And as you can see, there's certainly a large area there. And that's where a lot of the large lamb feedlots were. Just this past week, I was in San Angelo, Texas, 
And so you can see from central to west Texas, there's just a lot of sheep. And in fact, I know that this is a little bit dated of 2007, uh, but one of the things is due to the advantages in, in hair sheep, I expect that some of those, uh, we would have an increase in our southeast region as well. From a state to state standpoint, Texas, even with that large amount of animals in the central and western part of Texas are the largest in sheep production relative to states, followed by California with some grasses and, and, and sheep that can be raised in places such as the Imperial Valley and other places where there's forage uh, if drought so uh, allows them to have that opportunity. Uh, Colorado, I said, is a, truthfully a large feeding state. Wyoming, has, Wyoming, Utah, Idaho, and South Dakota have quite a bit of a few of ewes as well. Most of those then the lambs are fed elsewhere. And I wanted to put in the two states that I most work with, Minnesota and North Dakota, at Minnesota in 11th relative to the state rank, and North Dakota with 66,000 head of sheep uh, as of calendar year, January 1st, 2017. So we have went through a large decline, and particularly as the questions come up, um, we reach up to, from a decade standpoint, the highest at 56 million head of sheep in the early 1940s. Now, big picture, and I know that I've been to several different sheep uh, organizations and, and programs when they say, well, lamb isn't important anymore, or uh, lamb, it, it took a big challenge because of World War II. Now, that's true from a generational standpoint that a lot of soldiers, after they spent uh, some time uh, in between 1941 and 1945 during World War II, were fed mutton. And let me tell you, to the best of what I can entertain from people, it wasn't their most favorite dish. And in fact, a lot of the times, they'd come home and say to their uh, lovely wives and say, please, please don't serve me any lamb, any mutton, or anything that comes from a sheep. And so we balance that. But in fact, as we look at that, I'm past that. Those individuals that were in that era and in that generation are at the very youngest, 90 years old. And if we consider that an argument of where we need to be relative to merchandise American lamb, truthfully, I'm just not willing to accept it. Now, through the um, 1980s and 1990s, one of the big things that happened that changed, every, or changed a lot of people's games was the wool incentive. And there was a wool incentive program that provided quite a bit of of revenue for different producers. Now, was that the make it or break it for people? Probably not. But if you were breaking even and you were able to get a wool check from the government that was actually pulled in from tariffs on imported sheep and, and lamb and wool, or the imported wool, if we could be able to get some of that money and get it returned back to our producer, that was a positive thing. Now, that went away there during the 1990s, and that was one of the things that, um, that could also um, be able to be part of our challenge. Now, again, we're staying at an approximately 5 million head, and personally, I'd like to think that there's some room for improvement, but where that improvement is going to be, in my opinion, it's not the big people getting bigger. It's if we can get people that don't have sheep to have a few more, and those individuals to get started with it just a little bit more. The question is, is uh, where do the source of the statistics, and uh, to the best of my knowledge in the ag census, those that say that they have sheep or at least have identified to getting sheep, they try to get as much information as they can, but they certainly have a current list uh, that they can try to, uh, to grab that. They try to get as many little operations, but again, some of that is speculation, and uh, Sue, there's some possibility that there is a little bit of margin of error uh, to those, but for the most part, they sample those things the same uh, each year, and so we can at least think that with keeping those standards the same that we can expect something very similar. I touched on it a little bit as we've reduced our numbers of sheep in America that I believe that there's an opportunity uh, and that the future is bright for lamb, wool, and sheep production in America. I think that there is the chance that we could be able to build on consumption. I believe that we have an opportunity to improve on wool as well. Let's just look at some information 
that was gathered on potential on lamb consumption, and this is at home lamb consumption. 3% of Americans surveyed said that they consumed it more than once a week. Now let's be truthful and let's be honest. Most of us don't, don't probably fit in that spot. And in fact, if you think about it from your personal opinion, it may be once a month or once every three months for those that consume lamb and if they consume lamb at all. And in fact, I didn't put it in particularly in this um, slide set, but we're approximately and have been hovering at about 0 0.8 to 1.0 pounds of lamb per person per year. And in fact, there's lots of opportunity for us to continue to try to move forward a little bit farther relative to lamb consumption. Now, the exciting thing about moving and trying to get individuals to consume more lamb is that I believe that we have the opportunity to increase and improve the connection with the farmer and rancher. So in that top left, there is an individual there that has built a program and a branded lamb program in the northern part of Utah in the Salt Lake City area. And in the Park City area is actually where this is at the Park City Farmer's Market and being able to merchandise some lamb products. In fact, as you move to the right and to that center, I got the opportunity to meet with the individual that is the rancher of IO Ranch Lamb on the right side of it there. He's on, um, got the plaid shirt. And then um, a, a revolutionary bar slash diner owner at the Bonneville out uh, there in the middle in the pink or peach shirt. And so building that connection, and Jeff is able to merchandise and bring in lamb once a week. We also have, as you dig through there, just different opportunities of people saying, well, that I know your farmer and being able to merchandise that and be able to have pasture raised, grass fed, if it so works, but most importantly, making that connection uh, with individuals. As we talk about building that connection with the farmer and rancher to the consumer, I just can't help to do a presentation without putting this entertainment in here. So this was a product of a lamb shoulder blade chop that we, uh, that I was able to purchase at uh, a Albertson store in Fort Collins, Colorado. And so I traveled the country working on a, a national lamb quality audit, but more entertaining than any um, is that this lamb shoulder chop was born, hatched, and harvested in the United States. Now I'm all for labeling, and in fact, if we could be able to have that information, that's a great thing. But Wayne, I'm relatively convinced since you have some poultry background, some of those are hatched, but I've yet to see a sheep or a lamb that came out of an egg. This could be a special one, but I'm finally convinced that truthfully, we just had a labeling challenge that we're trying to accomplish. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about our sheep enterprises and just give you a little bit of a rundown relative to the infrastructure that is the sheep and lamb industry, and then we can dig back in. The purebred and seed stock operations are the framework of the commercial sheep industry. And if we look at those two pictures, those are more rugged Hampshire and Suffolk rams that have some uh, productivity and most commonly are being able to be used and merchant are being able to be used and bred to white faced ewes. These white faced ewes can come from a difference of dynamic groups of whether those are dorset or thin sheep faced, like they may be in the upper Midwest, so that you can increase the amount of lambing percentage that you may have. Or as you trend and move west, they could potentially be more Rambouillet in Colombia from a breeding standpoint. Or there's also opportunities that if we move particularly to the south and to the southeast, or, or now in a large part of Texas, we can expect even more in relation to the hair sheep of whether those are Dorpers, Royal Whites, or even the Katahdins that have been earlier mentioned. This is a picture that uh, did not come from Fargo, North Dakota, where I currently am stationed, but this one was actually from the um, foothills in Colorado from a, my master's research project but I think it shows a great thing relative to our Western range operations. And in fact, this is just a small subsection. Those were the, just the group out of a thousand head group of animals that were able to make their way to the backdrop. 
But if you look at it, those are productive Columbia to Rambouillet influence hues. And the lambs have kind of more of a speckled face or a smut face uh, type uh, a pr a type look to them. Most importantly for tonight's conversation, I want to more so touch on the eastern part of America, and that's a bit, again, a big generalization, but certainly more intensive than the ex extensive uh, approach of having 1,000 head of sheep in a band and sometimes a herder that may be able to manage those throughout each day and each evening. Now with these farm flocks, we have the opportunity to again, be able to manage them a little bit more intensively. And in fact, the picture on the left is of our North Dakota State University uh, sheep unit in the barn that we have there. And certainly it's filled with kind of ewe lamb pairs and different spots for the opportunity for those lambs to get some creep. We've got a picture that was just taken this past couple of weeks in the bottom right. It shows some lambing jugs and then uh, just a mix at uh, a local producer in the area that has uh, some Dorset, some South Downs, and some Hampshire and Club Lamb type uh, there, just uh, being able to mingle, and, and importantly, as we get uh, past this lovely, brisk uh, February days, to keep warm in a bedded down barn. The important thing, and I think something that no doubt could be a limiting factor, as we think about it on sheep on a small farm, is that facilities is something that we want to make sure that we can, if necessary, be creative about, or at least be able to evaluate how we're going to get there. And so whether we're new or we're experienced, there's always something that we say, you know, maybe we'd like a shinier barn here. Or, you know what, it'd be really nice if we had a continuous water over here in the corner. And man, it sure be nice if we could do a lot of things to either insulate the sides or as we saw in the end of, uh, picture on the right there, that happens more so than in the Midwest is building a hoop barn as well, something that's a little cheaper relative to the infrastructure of our sheep production industry, but also an important from our facilities to give us an idea of how we want to get there. Now, if I said I had all the answers related to the facilities, I'd truthfully be lying. And in fact, you have to identify what you're willing to do relative to capital investment and how you want to get there in relationship to your sheep entrepreneurship. Now, since we've got those that are part of our range flock or part of our farm flock, a lot of those individuals are not fed and not um, harvested. In fact, um, in the upper Midwest, if we were to call that, and of course with this local foods college, Minnesota's home base, a lot of those lambs are um, separated and sold elsewhere. But there are some lamb feed yards, particularly in the southern third of Minnesota, that people can be able to work with and to be able to provide alliances if you so chose. But not everything goes through the commercial processing uh, plants. Big picture, we've got three processing plants for the most part that do most of our harvest. One of those is in Denver, Colorado, another in Greeley, Colorado, and one in, um, in Dixon, California, or in the Sacramento area. Now we do have opportunities as we move east towards Illinois and towards uh, Michigan as well to be able to merchandise some products, but that's not as quite of a high of a level as some of the higher production areas. And consequently, that's a large reason why we expect to see some of those um, feed yards of greater in incidence in the Colorado area. Now here's one of my few slides that I have a little bit more words than probably I should and probably uh, we'd, we'd want to dig in and look at. But I want to make sure that we can focus and at least be able to name some of those different breeds that are of more importance. And, and maybe you could pick out the one that's most um, important for you. We'll talk about it just a little bit as we define our goals and to be able to evaluate what we want to accomplish. The finest of those sheep are, are the Delane Merino and then also the Rambouillet. The crossbreds that kind of stay in the middle. And as we think about these of where their emphasis is on wool or meat, or dual purpose are the Targi, the Cordell, of course my family's breed and, and personal favorite, and the Columbia. In the medium, we have more emphasis there, truthfully on growth and production. And we'll talk about that as we look at those meat breed sheep of Suffolk, Hampshire, Dorset, Cheviot, Monadale, Southdown, Shropshire, Tunis, and 
probably Polypay, but of course Polypay has the opportunity to increase the amount of bursts that we've got. There's also long wolves, and more commonly in terms of a regional and location, those might be more accepted in the in the western third or, or even the western coast of the Oregon, Washington, or Northern California, because there's so much different rain that happens out there that you don't want that density of fiber, and that allows them to be able to be a little bit more functional there. The Caracal or the Icelandic or even the Scottish blackface have more of a double coat or just a really harsh um, and then produce a wool uh, that can be used for rugs. And in fact, of course, there's been even more emphasis um, uh, that that uh, also then that there's the hair sheep that there are the Katahdin, the Dorpers, and the St. Croix. Yes, thank you, Heidi. There are long wools that uh, are medium or even finer. So with the wool breeds, again, I talked about these, but most commonly, these wool breeds, at least from a production standpoint at the large locations uh, in the central or western locations, these are ones that can be most commonly used as, as ewe breeds and be able to be that multiplier that we potentially need. But we could potentially use the Rambolets that are up at the top side or even the Columbias uh, with a little bit of extra growth and extra frame there on the top right. Some of the meat breeds that are more common on the, the top are the Hampshire and the Suffolk. And then I also wanted to put some females in there as well because I know that a good moderate frame dorset like the one on the right, even though she's a meat breed and the emphasis isn't particularly on her wool type, she's one that can still be productive. Dorsets have a great advantage by being able to lamb out of season and be able to provide uh, several amount of lambs. Hair breeds on the top, and, and both there's the Dorper and the White Dorper on those top two of the males on this side. And then on the bottom side, both Katahdin, and then on the farthest left on the bottom, a combination of Dorper and St. Croix that has been merchandised as Royal Whites, but provide a little bit more frame size. As I said, just this past week, I was in San Angelo, Texas, and got the opportunity to go to different locations that are living in a range world where there's just a little bit of grass growing. And in fact, those of us in Minnesota um, would probably not see or find the similarities in terms of the characteristics of the grasses that they've got down there. But some of these hair breeds, and as we talked about, or at least was mentioned, can be commingled with goats as well so that you can be able to continue to provide pounds. And in fact, from an extensive management standpoint, they're ones that can do it and do it very well. They cycle more regularly, and you have the opportunity to have certainly a few more lambs because of that out-of-season breeding that doesn't always happen for some of our uh, different uh, breeds that we are more accustomed to in the upper Midwest. Now, I realize that this one's got uh, plenty of words on it as well, but I think that these are just so important in terms of what we can do and I wanted to grab it all onto one slide as we look at the 12 lamb crop best practices. I know that we have our optimal nutrition, and in fact, it's critical that we be able to provide that nutrition to those animals and to those ewes primarily. We'll talk about that as well just a little bit later. We can breed those ewe lambs at seven to nine months of age if you so choose to. And in fact, if you think about it, those are ones, and some people ask me, of should I breed my ewe lambs? I personally believe that allow the ewe to tell you that answer. If you provide exposure from the ram, they will either cycle or they won't, and they will decide relative to whether they are ready for that pregnancy. Now, some may and some may not, depending on how those uh, are, are managed by no means, but it's certainly I, I personally believe you allow those individuals to tell you. They're the ones living in it, and they will know uh, if that's what's best for them. Select for prolific genetics. I talked about that, particularly with an increase in uh, breeds or animals, such as fin sheep or polypays, that will allow for an increase in the amount of lambs born. It's important, as I look back on that picture with the mountains in the background, to use crossbreeding. It's simple, it's easy, it's hybrid vigor, and it's a bonus for us to reproduce in terms of the production of our lambs. Call the underperforming ewes. 
whether those are ones with bad bags, ones that that may or may not have lost their lambs, or are just being not returning the amount of lambs and products that you prefer, we can be able to try to get a little bit better, get our genetic base a little bit tighter, and be able to continue to raise the ones that we want to. Now, it sounds easier, and it's only three words there on reduced lamb loss, but in fact, it's not that easy. And in fact, I know that it takes a tremendous amount of work and a lot of time of when we're going to work with those individuals and work with our ewes to make sure that those lambs are born as best as we can. But we could try to keep them as warm as possible and get some colostrum and get some um, up, to get those lambs uh, up and going as best we possibly can. We can test for pregnancy uh, status through ultrasound and be able to have that if we so chose to manage those animals just a little bit better or those used with multiple births to provide them with a little bit of extra nutrition. Big picture, it's important on disease prevention and treatment. Interestingly, we can match reproduction to management. And in fact, individuals here in the balmy state of North Dakota, I know it sounds cool, it's February, it's four degrees this morning when I came in. And so some of those individuals may or may not want to uh, line up with the reproduction of those relative to management. And in fact, those individuals that so choose to lamb those ewes out in April or May and then have grass coming at a later time may provide themselves just a little bit better match to truthfully the environment that they're in. It's important to semen test the fertility of those rams and to do a breeding soundness exam. And particularly, it's always good to develop a relationship with your veterinarian. We can manage for seasonal changes in reproduction and and if we look at it a little bit more uh, diligently, at least in our operation with our Cordells, and certainly some with the Dorsets that may have that advantage as well, and a lot of the hair breeds, we could be able to have uh, ewes that will lamb out of season or in September and October when comparison to most of the lambs will come in the spring. That allows us a different opportunity relative to our marketplace. And if we really want to gear up, now realize when you make this decision to accelerate your lambing cycle, that also you are um, expecting that you're probably going to wean those lambs quicker if you so chose to do that. And then they use not, in my personal opinion, doing her part. And you potentially have to provide a little bit higher plane of nutrition. I throw this in here just to draw a home base for you. And on management per 100 ewes, we can have an, a, at least an indication of what we would expect relative to lambs. Now this one is actually a little dated and I didn't, wasn't able to find the newest information, but as you can see, Minnesota does a really good job. Now that could be because Wayne is one heck of a small ruminant expert and has been passing on knowledge to sheep producers for many, many years. And it's important, maybe he's taking credit and just sitting back in the chair, but it's also partly because we have a more intensive program. Those animals, for the most part, are lambed with decision makings and particularly in the southeastern or southwestern part of our state have a design program that they are working on. Those producers are part of a program that aim for prolificacy and aim for increasing the amount of lamb saved per 100 use. Now we can make improvements and no doubt, but that certainly as we look at it from afar, anytime that we're over, in my personal opinion, 150% lamb crop, we're doing a lot of things right. If you cho so choose to dig in and make it to 200%, you're doing an amazing job. And in fact, then you're setting the bar pretty high relative to your contemporaries. And hopefully if you make those decisions, you, uh, you are certainly having that advantages on, on, on production. A couple small things relative to you management. We can be able to evaluate body condition and score. And in fact, I think that that's a good thing from a one to five standpoint. I didn't put all of the information up there. I just put the number three, which is closest to the middle that can look at how much fat is over that top line. And you'll be able to tell that with some experience and then with some visual appraisal. And you'll also want to use your hand over that backbone and over the ribs to identify where those animals are. From a flushing standpoint, use prior to breeding and at the beginning of breeding season, we can increase the energy that is allowed for those animals, which means a half a pound to a pound 
per sheep per day of some combination of grain or supplement. That can increase the ovulation rate. And so if you want to move from 130% lamp crop to 150% lamp crop, it's as easy an opportunity as we can because it gets those ewes and those girls to cycle just a little bit more. We could provide ourselves with more multiple births, but as you make that decision for more multiple births, realize that if we keep those lambs alive, and that's certainly our goal, that we're probably also going to have more bottle lambs. And so that way you can have more to accomplish it morning and evening or provide an alternative way to be able to provide those milk, whether that be now newer milking machines or working with goats or whatever those so may be. The last thing is, is that in that late pregnancy, we're going to have 70% of our fetal growth in the last four to six weeks. And so consequently, we want to continue to increase that uh, supplements that we potentially have or at least feed higher quality hay to those ewes so that we can get those lambs out and have them born um, successfully. This one's pretty big picture. And in fact, uh, as we look at it, of course our ewes are gonna increase in terms of weight relative to lambing. And then we'll, we'll use that but it's important to realize that as we move through lactation, that we keep that nutritional plane high enough that we can then, after we wean those sheep, try to get some of that body condition score back and at least look at that so that we can be able to get those ewes as they dry up back at breeding to still be at a good spot relative to plane of nutrition so that we can continue to increase the amount of lambs that we are being able to produce. Here's a quick uh, slide looking at lamb survival and body condition score. Body condition score on the bottom um, scale, x-axis, and lamb survival on the top. And of course, we're going to have more of those single lambs that would probably stay successful or stay alive. But we can know that when we have those twins and that those are females that are way lower on their body condition score, that in fact, we can probably have less uh, lamb survival. I throw this one in here, big picture. And you can decide if this is enough or if you want to do more. Pre-breeding and mid-breeding anti-abortion vaccines, whether that be Campylobacter, Chlamydia, or Vibrio to look at, and those could be advantageous to make sure that we don't have a storm. Now you can do it without it, but when things go bad, things go really bad. And so consequently, I think it's some pretty cheap insurance. Clostridium perfringens, C and D, and also C and D in tetanus, can be used for those use. I think it's important to watch foot rot and trim hooves on those as, as necessary. And then as we look at those lambs, that clostridium and perfinges or CD or CD and T is certainly something that's important. It's also considered overeating disease and making sure that we provide that booster to those animals. And if you so wish, uh, some individuals may choose to uh, vaccinate for sore mouth. Now, as we look at it from lamb management, we're able to evaluate um, nursing and the colostrum and making sure that those animals receive the colostrum that is necessary for them and for their production. One of the things as we look at those and we look at lamb management is that in fact, we want to accomplish the things um, that can be beneficial for those lambs. You can so choose to tail dock it. And in fact, if those did, um, those are, and uh, you would want to do that on most wool sheep, particularly to make sure that we don't have challenges relative to fly strike or problems in maggots at a later time. But on hair sheep, it seems to be less of a problem because there's not that wool at that standpoint. Castrating can be beneficial, but if you so choose to sell your lambs early enough and quick enough, it may not be necessary as well relative to uh, keeping those as intact rams or males. I threw a picture there of an example of a scrapey ear tag that would have your premises number, the U.S. shield, and then an identification number. You can choose your ear uh, tattoo, uh, what your marking system is, and vaccinate those lambs if you potentially can. You're going to have to make your decision of after 60 days or approximately, and that could be more than 45 pounds. They could do a pound a day or even a little bit more if they're a high-growth blackface but you have to decide of whether you want to feed or sell those lambs. The last thing that I wanna to touch on here, uh, at least in this portion, is looking at the veterinary feed directive. And the veterinary feed directive started in January 1st of 2017. 
and in fact says that different medically important antibiotics um, that are listed there, particularly that would be important for our sheep producers, is chlorotetracycline and aramycin. Being able to have those because of a small um, minor use species exemption, we're going to want to work with our veterinarian because we can still use aramycin or aramycin crumbles or the chlorotetracycline in feeds if we have a veterinary feed directive to potentially decrease the incidence of uh, abortions from female, uh, of our pregnant females. It's important to know your veterinarian, develop a valid veterinary client-patient relationship, and to be able to realize that we're putting an emphasis on animal and human health. It's going to take some paperwork in order to get this uh, feed and feeds made for you, but we can be able to, again, be ahead. I think it's a good thing that you know your veterinarian and know the animal health programs that you so have. I'm going to make a little bit of shift as we're past now a little bit of the demographics that we were talking about for the U.S. sheep industry. We've talked about production merit and different ways that we can be able to improve our, our production systems. But now I want to focus, and I know um, as we dig through this here and, and close up our back end of this, is that how can we add more value? And truthfully, this is where my passion is relative to this information of saying, what can we do that can allow more, um, that can focus on our product and that we can do it consistently and again, so that we can make a little bit of money. I only have four slides focusing on wool and I know that there may be individuals in our audience that are interested in focusing on fiber fest or fiber opportunities being able to merchandise wool and in fact I look forward to working with you if that's the case so that I could be a part of it and help you to build those connections. I know particularly in Minnesota there's lots of fiber festivals and and certainly um, those are coming up. There's also a group in the central or northern part um, which uh, looks at the sustainable farming in the area and there's a group closer to the Twin Cities and both of those groups have some impact and have some emphasis on connecting the consumer with the producer related to woolen fibers. Of the four criteria, fineness of fiber diameter, we would expect those that are a little bit finer, like the one on the left, to be um, used in potentially higher end suits. Maybe something through the middle could go towards a shirt, um, but also wool is very versatile and excitingly, it can be used in lots of different opportunities. The fine wool will potentially have more crimp or crimp per inch, and that's the waviness or the natural curl in that wool fiber. Now, we would expect that a lot of those um, coarser fibers will also be longer stapled. And in fact, that's just the inherent trait that comes with that of when those are a little bit coarser, we would expect them in general to be longer. They can be used for several different things, but also we want to... Uh, be able to produce a clean wool. And that yield, or the amount of clean wool on the bottom, is the same as the raw wool or the raw wool weight minus the shrinkage that's washed out, or the shrink that's washed out from those products. And whether that's vegetable matter, the greaser lanolin, or some of that extra Minnesota dirt that made it into the uh, fleeces. Uh, wait uh, just a minute, uh, Travis, before we continue. We've yep. had several questions come in. I sent you a couple that were sent to me. I sent them to you as presenter, and then we've had another one that went to all participants. Okay. Um, value of ultrasound versus marking harness and or semen test. Uh, I would say that marking harness um, is going to be the cheapest, but that one's going to cause you the most time to be able to keep that marking harness um, fresh with the crayon and its chest floor and being able to um, being able to uh, to count them and watch those females. So that would be well, the cheapest, uh, oh, not the easiest. Um, and along that even, line, yep. along that line uh, a young lady said that she had not had yet luck using a marking harness and wondered if um, ultrasound was available through NDSU. Were there students who might do it uh, at a convenient price? Um, we have yet to attack that. Um, there are individuals, if you wish to respond to me at the contact uh, later, 
that do uh, provide those services um, correct relative to the North Dakota Veterinary Medical Association. Uh, you need a veterinary degree in order to confirm diagnosis, uh, but I am willing to uh, work with those individuals uh, to uh, facilitate the right people that can be able to make it there. The semen test just allows you at least the opportunity that they can and will be fertile and uh, the ultrasound uh, at least can then be able to be useful. But there are people that are learning um, how to ultrasound and make that clarification. And uh, I know that there are individuals that are, are willing to travel uh, in Minnesota and help you with it. Do you have to vaccinate? Um, I would most definitely vaccinate against uh, Clostridium perfringens C and D. Um, and you can still raise um, animals organically and have vaccinations. Now that's not uh, a relative to the organic standards. Vaccinations are still allowed because that's a preventative management practice. Mention uh, how to change, also, what's, go ahead. Yeah, there's also a question about how do sheep benefit the environment? Uh, so sheep, uh, big picture, benefit the environment by taking use of the um, cellulose and hemicellulose and lignin that are in those plants. And so obviously uh, um, I prefer not to eat a salad every day and those sheep get to be able to do that and convert that into lean meat. Are they beneficial relative to um, management of wooded areas? Absolutely. And I think uh, from the northern part of Minnesota, we can be able to uh, use those uh, sheep as a resource on either clearing of different trees and areas and locations and I think that there's a tremendous amount of opportunity from that standpoint. So from a prescribed grazing, or at least knowing what you're going to graze, uh, you have those benefits uh, to improve the ecology and the environment within that area. Question on, um, mentioned how to change feeding practices if selling wool at fiber fairs. I wouldn't drastically change feeding practices, and if you do drastically change feeding practices um, for them, it will change the fiber diameter. So if you went from having them hang out in the grass pasture to feeding them a higher energy diet, then that will change um, the fiber diameter and the crimp differences for that. More importantly than the feeding practices are is that you don't want to throw the bale over top of the gate and let it all go on top of their uh, back and on their neck and try to keep that as clean as you possibly can. So you want to make sure that you can keep those fleeces as clean as you possibly can if you're so choosing to sell it on a raw standpoint. Otherwise, you can be able to, again, wash it and be able to clean it. Nice, Heidi, you said they eat buckthorn. No doubt, that's a good thing for us, uh, particularly in, uh, in Minnesota. Do you have any other pressing questions there as we uh, um, turn the, the seven o'clock and I'll try to dig through this uh, relatively quickly, Wayne? I think that's it for the time being. Okay, I'm gonna primarily, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, leave this uh, slide uh, in a presentation just for a reference for you. Our most uh, expensive uh, products are in that rack and loin, um, and then now even the shoulder is higher than the leg, uh, but those middle meats are going to be more advantageous. Uh, a carcass uh, this week uh, is worth approximately $200. So why do people purchase lamb? From my research on looking at the National Lamb Quality Audit in 2015, the primary reason that people purchase lamb is because of flavor. And in fact, the exciting thing relative to sheep and lamb production is that the reason that people purchase lamb is because of flavor. However, depressingly, the reason that people don't purchase lamb is also because of flavor. And so if we can be able to identify that, that would be a great thing. We also realize in the National Lamb Quality Audit that local is important. And that's why I'm excited to serve as the University of Minnesota and NDSU Extension Specialist because I'm excited to help to build those relationships for those small operators 
um, to be able to get to different markets. That top left one was in a Whole Foods in Texas, and certainly an individual called Local Yokel, and being able to develop that know-your-farmer type role. I also believe, as we close some of this up, is that we embrace the pastoral image and that lamb has that, as we talked about from that question, has a tremendous advantage in terms of environmental stewardship or at least the image and the holistic image that is lamb and lamb production. Because if we think of other commodities, some of those may think of feed yards or even confined feeding um, opportunities and, and operations of whether those be on different proteins. But people don't think about that when they think of uh, sheep and lamb. I want to touch on an important part of our individuals on a non-traditional marketing location. There's more and more sheep, uh, Wayne, that are going through non-traditional channels and going to different people of different ethnicities. Lots of people consume lamb or mutton at a greater weight, at a greater rate than um, than a Caucasian individuals. And in fact, we have a tremendous amount of opportunity to help facilitate the production of these. Oftentimes, they may prefer them at 60 to 80 pounds live or at different locations, but whether those are from um, a Mexican uh, grocery store on the uh, left to different opportunities of an Asian uh, grocery store or anything in between of people that want to do direct slaughter, we can be able to make some of those uh, opportunities and some of those improvements. I want to touch on this on a non-traditional marketing that the sheep production uh, management issues of how you're going to produce those, of why we touched on that for the earlier half an hour, is important. Assessing the value of the product and pricing it for consumers. If we're going to do direct marketing, it's important that we identify what those prices are, what those products are that we're producing. Really, really critical and what makes it so tough is that we also want to work with USDA inspected processing facilities. And if I have sheep and my consumer wants lamb, right or wrong, we want to work with either state inspected or USDA inspected processing facilities. And I'm working with our particularly our Minnesota Department of Agriculture and there is a, a, a document that has some of the approved locations uh, for uh, slaughter and harvest and hope to get that information to our group uh, at a later point. The legal status of on-farm harvesting can be a problem and most importantly it's tough to pull all this information together. Now lamb marketing and as we look at it can go lots of different ways. I already showed you that local one in the bottom right but also a product that were in uh, San Antonio, Texas was looking at Lava Lake lamb and being able to merchandise that with different label claims. As you define this and try to build what you want to market, of which is the best to market, okay, as Chris says, lamb or sheep, most commonly individuals have a more preferred uh, opinion about the word lamb than the word sheep, and even more so than the word mutton. There's a huge generational change, and in fact, I saw it earlier in our chat uh, that was discussed about uh, from generations, uh, from who do we, um, from Chris as well, that I myself have only had it uh, twice. The children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren have never had it. And the exciting thing is, is that it, there is a tremendous of opportunity for these foodies and these target audiences to be able to be a little bit more entrepreneurial. No matter where you're at, of, of particularly, and, and luckily enough, uh, Wayne, I sneak into the millennial category, and so I get the opportunity to ride the brand as a, as a millennial and sneak in. But those with, that are millennials also consider themselves now, at this stage in their lives, to be a little bit more affluent. And some of them have now gotten jobs and gotten out into our workplace, and they don't want a chicken salad sandwich. They don't want just the home base. And so lamb has a tremendous opportunity to be on more menus and to be able to be featured and to be able to be merchandised for different audiences. Historically, sheep went through a crazy price hike in 2011 and 2012. Now let me tell you that most importantly, I'm excited that now, as we envision it coming forward, we can expect just a little bit um, freer or 
hopefully less volatile prices on the commercial market. Prices right now are hanging at approximately $1.40 price per pound for live lambs. Um, and uh, that, as expected from the Livestock Marketing Information Center, we can expect to aim and stay within $1.30 to $1.50 in at least the upcoming years. The direct marketing tips that we want to close on here is that quality lamb sells, but you want to define your brand. Again, a good processor is key on what we are trying to identify and what we are trying to make for um, our products. There is pricing available at the USDA lamb market summary, and then an important part about this is selling the least desirables. It's easy to sell rack. It's easy to sell lamb or lamb legs. And in fact, then for the rest of it, you have to decide whether you want to make a, um, a bratwurst or a merguez, a lamb merguez, and different uh, uh, processed meats to be able to merchandise that. And if you so chose to do this, particularly when we make decisions for our operations on merchandising lamb, that we want to know what our cut yields are. We'll close it up here on lamb is the journey. This is the lamb on the right that actually was born in Minnesota. He's a stud, maybe the coolest sheep and lamb carcass I've ever seen in my life. Start with a quality product, find a processor, minimize pre-slaughter stress, age the carcass a little bit as well. That allows some post-mortem degradation and improvements in tenderness, and then fabrication and packaging, product labeling, marketing, and hopefully what we're doing is striving to meet customer um, expectations. So we're trying to dig and be a big part of the, the restaurant tour industry. And most importantly, I'm excited to work with you guys as individuals so that we can provide products for um, consumers. If we can dig in on production goals, then we can be successful in meeting those products. We can have high conception rates, high lambing rates, reduce that low lamb mortal, um, mortality, and maintain our wool. We can potentially improve what we like to say, Wayne, is dollar, dollar bill, yeah. Or maybe that's just you. But we can be able to improve our production equation. I put just a quick uh, evaluation because I believe that there is opportunity for profit. 140-pound lamb at $1.40, and those are both averages for where we're at right now, is a 196. If we say that on average one you will have twins and one you will have singles, and so we'd have 1.5 lambs produced, then we'd have $294 of income plus $11 of wool. If we were to share 11 pounds, that'd get us to 305. If we so chose to have our cost of production at $150 per ewe, and of those lambs that were born, that it cost us, and we got them to 60 pounds just based on the ewe, but then if we finished those last 80 pounds of those lambs, then it potentially cost us $70. And so that would get us to $255. Now, I know this is a generalization. I realize that, ladies and gentlemen. But right now, there's uh, several different animals and proteins that are being produced that you can't calculate a $50 per head profit. And so there's opportunity, and that's even without taking the opportunity to sell and merchandise those from a direct market. I hope you found this entertaining. I've went 14 minutes longer than I preferred. But again, we got started a little bit about 14 minutes uh, slower than uh, what we were happening. Do I, um, but I've provided this resources, and uh, I will allow us to keep it at this, and we will open it up for continued questions and answering those uh, throughout the day. And we still had 45 out of our 50 people that were kind enough to hang with us. So I appreciate your guys' kind emphasis on, uh, on being a part of uh, the local foods college, and I'll leave it with this uh, contact information for myself if you so wish to get a hold of me. When